Today, I'm gonna to be sharing eight of the best things to make in the Instant Pot. Hi, I'm Karen Peterson, and I own the website 365 Days of Slow and Pressure Cooking. Here on YouTube, I share Instant Pot stuff with you every single week. Today, I'm gonna to be sharing eight of my favorite things to make in the Instant Pot and why I like making them in the Instant Pot and why it's better than making them perhaps in the traditional way. Number one, hard boiled eggs. My favorite thing to do is make hard boiled eggs like a huge batch at the beginning of the week in my Instant Pot. The reason I love it so much is not necessarily because it's a faster method, but because the peels almost slide off. They're so easy to peel. Even farm fresh eggs peel a lot easier using your Instant Pot than using the stovetop method. And here's how I make Instant Pot hard boiled eggs. The first thing that I wanna mention is that I live at about 4,500 feet above sea level, and that will probably affect the cooking time a little bit. So if you're at sea level, whatever results I get today, your eggs might be a little bit more cooked than what I show you. So you may want to adjust your cooking time depending where you're, at, where you're at in the world. I'm going to be using large eggs. If you use extra large eggs or medium eggs instead, that might affect the cooking time as well. Another thing that might affect the cooking time is the temperature of the water that you put into your Instant Pot. I just got it straight out of the tap and it was like not hot, it wasn't cold, it was just kind of in between and I put it straight into the pot. If you're using boiling water, that's going to affect the cooking time. If you're using ice cold water, that would affect the cooking time also. And another thing that may affect cooking time just a little bit um, is the amount of eggs that you have in there. Let's say you fill the pot full to the brim, which I don't really recommend filling it to the brim, but with eggs, that might take um, your pot longer to reach pressure than if you're just putting one single egg in there. Today, I'm gonna be putting about six eggs in each pot. All right, let's get started. So. I'm gonna add the eggs into the pot. I have the trivet that came with my pot in the bottom with one cup of water. Six eggs on top of that trivet. It doesn't matter if they're touching or not touching. Just add them into there. All right, so we have our eggs in our pot. Place the lid on the pot. Make sure the valve's set to sealing. And for this one, I'm gonna use the manual button and it's on high pressure, I'm gonna adjust the time to only two minutes. This one, I'm gonna set the manual button and I'm gonna set it to five minutes. All right, this one has reached five minutes. This is gonna be our five, five, five experiment. So release the pressure. Use some tongs to move the eggs into a bowl full of ice and water. And this one was the two minute and then the 10 minute NPR. So it's reached 10 minutes, so we can just move the valve to um, venting. There's not any pressure left, so we can just take the lid off and then take those eggs and put them in the ice bath too. All right, so both of the eggs cooled in the ice bath for about five minutes, just until they're cold to the touch. And now we have the moment of truth. So five, five, five method right here. Let's go ahead and cut into it. Looks pretty perfect to me. All right, let's go for this one. See if there's a difference. Well, they look pretty much exactly the same. I'm gonna eat them and then I'll let you know if there's a difference in taste. <laughs> I tasted each of them and they're so, so similar, but I think there's a slight difference with the 555 method. They're just a little bit not as creamy. Um, these ones were more of a creamy consistency and this was more, not grainy, because it was pretty creamy, but it wasn't as creamy as these ones. I'm gonna keep doing my eggs with the two minute, 10 minute NPR. 555 is a great method and it is easier to remember because it's five minutes cooking time, five minutes NPR, five minutes ice, and it's just an easy way to remember it. Number two, so, Greek yogurt. Now, you can easily go to the store and buy some Greek yogurt. But the reason that I like to make my own Greek yogurt is because I know exactly what's going in and it is a lot cheaper. I can buy a gallon of milk at my grocery store for about two bucks. 
I can make eight cups of yogurt for $2. Now that is a steal. Here's how I make Instant Pot Greek yogurt. First things first, make sure that your Instant Pot actually has the yogurt button. Um, some uh, models of Instant Pot do not have it, so I'm gonna be showing you how to make it in the Instant Pot as long as it has the yogurt button. I know there are ways to make it in the Instant Pot when you don't have a yogurt button, um, but I, I'm just doing the, the way that I know how, which is in the Instant Pot that um, has that function. So first things first, go ahead and pour in a gallon of milk. Today I have 1%, but many, many times I use whole milk because I love the full fat yogurt. My um, ideal would probably be 2% just because it's kind of a happy meeting between the lower fat and the higher fat. So whatever kind of milk that you have, you can use. Now you can use a half gallon if you don't want to use a full gallon, that's just fine. But I'm going to be pouring in the whole gallon of milk today. And that will make about um, eight or nine cups of Greek yogurt and more if you're not making it into Greek yogurt. All right, you're going to go ahead and put the lid on. But before that, I'm going to change out my ceiling ring. This is just something that I prefer to do. Um, one time I made yogurt where the night before I'd made curry in the Instant Pot and my yogurt tasted like curry. It was really weird. So I like to keep this green ceiling ring um, just for yogurt. So um, you can buy an extra ceiling ring on Amazon and I will link to where I got this one from. Um, it, I don't know, it was probably less than 10 bucks for a pack of three, very inexpensive. Okay, so go ahead and put the lid on. And then you're gonna hit the yogurt button. And you're gonna push um, adjust until you get to where it says boil. Once it turns on to boil, you're gonna go ahead and walk away and it will take about 45 minutes for this to get to the proper um, temperature. Once that cycle is over, you can go ahead and remove the lid. And I like to use this digital thermometer. I bought it on Amazon. I'll link to it in the notes. But it makes it handy because what you need, you need this milk to be at 180 degrees or warmer. 181, 182 is fine. And it should be really close if it's not already there. Now, if it's not there, you don't need to go ahead and do the yogurt cycle again. All you need to do is push saute and let it um, and whisk it really good until it gets to 180 degrees. Mine is at 180 degrees, so I'm gonna go ahead and remove, um, you may wanna use hot pads. Mine's not too hot. Remove it from the pot. So what I'm doing is I put a stopper in the sink, and then I'm just filling it up with cold water, just so the cold water can surround the pot and cool down the yogurt quicker. This will take about 10 minutes to get the, to get the, um, the milk to the temperature that it needs to be at. I like to whisk it several times, just kind of get the air flowing and it seems to work uh, faster when I do that. Once this is cooled down to between 90 and 100 degrees, you're good to go. I like to just test it right in the middle of the pot so that I, um, towards the edges, is gonna be a different temperature than the middle. So you kinda wanna just whisk it up really good and then test it in the middle and make sure that it, it reads between 90 and 100. At this point, you'll stir in your starter. So what you need for a starter the very first time you make it is um, just some plain yogurt. Um, this one's Greek yogurt, but it can be just normal yogurt. It just needs to make sure that it has live active cultures in it um, and it's not flavored or anything like that. So this is plain Greek yogurt um, and it's uh, got live cultures. So. I just eyeball it, but you're supposed to do about two tablespoons of yogurt and you just go ahead and put in a little separate bowl. And then you're gonna um, add in about the same amount of milk and you'll just stir that up until it's creamy and smooth. I've whisked the um, starter into the milk in the pot. Now I'm gonna put the lid on. You could have it on ceiling or venting, it really doesn't matter because it doesn't come to pressure. I always just put it on ceiling out of habit. And then I'm gonna go ahead and push the yogurt button here. And then I'm gonna push the adjust button until it gets to eight hours. I like 
my yogurt a little bit less tart, so I go for eight hours. If you like your yogurt more tart, then go higher towards about 10 hours. It's up to you, so between eight and 10 hours. Now, you're gonna notice something different than the normal pressure cooking mode. When this switches over, it's gonna start counting up instead of counting down. So usually, it's if it said, it would say eight hours and then it would go to 759, 758, but this actually counts up. So don't worry about that, that's normal. And once it gets to the eight hours, it will do another little beeping sound and you'll know that your yogurt um, is, is done. After your yogurt has chilled for several hours, you can go ahead and um, strain it. You could also just have the yogurt um, like it is now if you want Greek yogurt. This is the way that I make it. I get a bowl and then my colander and I put the colander on top of the bowl. And then I use just one of these flour sacks. You can buy these in a 10 pack for very inexpensive at the store on Amazon, wherever. And I use it instead of cheesecloth, um, just cause that's what I had at my house and it works really good. Um, and I go ahead and put it on top of the strainer. And then I'm gonna go ahead and put the yogurt into this strainer. And then I kind of just bring up the edges and kind of just either tie them up or just kind of go like that, twist them, put them like that. And then I put this in the fridge until um, plenty of whey has come off of this. You can see right here, you see it dripping down. So the whey is going to get up, I don't know, about that high. And um, then I go ahead and your Greek yogurt is ready to eat. So I left my yogurt in my fridge for several hours. I kind of forgot about it. And look how much whey is in there. It's a ton. So that's okay though. If, if it's really thick, your yogurt's really thick, you can always add your whey back into it, but you can't take it out. So it's better to have it um, too much whey in here than not enough. Does that make sense? So I'm gonna go ahead and I have this big container that I like to, it's a nine and a half cup container that I put my yogurt in. And this was from a gallon of milk. So I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of dump that in as best as I can without making a mess. So you can see here, the consistency is almost like cream cheese. That's how much, um, how thick it is. So I'm obviously gonna add some of this back in to make it more creamy and a little less thick. So basically you just kind of pour in as much as you think you want, go ahead and get a whisk and stir it up really well. Add in more whey as you need it. And then once it gets to your desired consistency, you're good to go. And then you can just cover an airtight container, keep it in your fridge. Mine lasts for, I don't know, up to three, three weeks. Then when you want to make your next batch of yogurt, you just use two tablespoons of this to start your next batch. Or you can always use um, some of your whey and that can be used as your starter. Number three, roast. Now, roast is one of those things that I always used to make in a slow cooker. And that is awesome because the slow cooker is a great tool for that. But sometimes I would forget to put the meal in at the beginning of the day or I wouldn't I would, I would try to start cooking, but it would be kind of later in the morning and it wouldn't be enough time to cook the roast in time in a slow cooker. And that is why the Instant Pot is so awesome because it only takes probably two hours from start to finish to make a melt in your mouth, falling apart, tender roast. Here's how I make Instant Pot rump roast just using three ingredients. The first thing that I did was add in my rump roast into the Instant Pot. It's about two and a half pounds of rump roast. I trimmed off the excess fat that was on the sides, but it didn't have a ton of fat to begin with. Now I'm going to add in two cups of water, and then I picked up this au jus gravy mix packet at my grocery store. I'm going to add that in. And then I'm gonna add in a um, onion soup mix packet. Looks like that. 
All right, so that's basically it. <laughs> We're gonna go ahead and put the, t the lid on. All right, we're gonna make sure the valve is set to sealing, which it is. Then we're gonna go ahead and set the timer. So we're gonna push the manual button, or if you have a pressure cook button, push that manual. And this recipe is gonna take a lot longer than most recipes that we make. We're gonna set this all the way up to 90 minutes. That's gonna ensure that the roast gets nice and tender. And then the, the Instant Pot will beep and we'll turn to the pressure building mode. Once your pot has finished the time that we set, the 90 minutes, you can go ahead and move the valve from sealing to venting. Once all the pressure has been released, go ahead and open the pot. And at this point, you can add in your vegetables. I'm gonna add in baby carrots and fairly big chunks of potatoes. Go ahead and replace the lid. Make sure valve is set to ceiling. And we're gonna set it for manual. Oops, we gotta turn the off button first. And then manual, and we'll go down to five minutes. Just enough time to cook those carrots and potatoes. Once the pot starts beeping, you can go ahead and do a release of the pressure. Move the valve from venting or from sealing to venting. Once you can, go ahead and remove the lid. It looks fantastic. I'm going to go ahead and scoop the vegetables and meat onto this platter, and then I'm going to make a gravy with the drippings that remain. Okay, now that I have everything on my platter, I'm gonna go ahead and switch this over to the saute mode. You have to turn it to the off first, right there, and then turn it to saute, right there. And that's just gonna turn it on so that it kind of heats up the pot. Just like if this was on a stove burning, that's kind of what it is doing right now in the saute mode. So while that's heating up, I'm gonna go ahead and mix together Equal parts cold water with cornstarch. This is just gonna go ahead and thicken the gravy very nicely. I did about two tablespoons of water and two tablespoons of uh, cornstarch. So, I'm gonna get my whisk. I'm gonna go ahead and whisk this cornstarch into the broth and drippings that remain in the pot. Go ahead and just whisk that up until it thickens. It should only take a couple of minutes to thicken. Once it starts bubbling up, you know it's pretty much thickened by then. We have a nice, thick gravy. Go ahead and turn off the pot. And then I'm gonna go ahead and serve my roast potatoes, carrots, and gravy. Number four, rice. It's so easy in the Instant Pot because all you have to do is put the water and the rice in and push a button and walk away and come back and you don't even have to worry about it um, getting crunchy on the bottom of that pan or boiling over or not being done enough. In the case of brown rice, that was always my issue is that the brown rice would, would not cook evenly. In the Instant Pot, it comes out perfect every time. Here's how I make brown rice in the Instant Pot. To make brown rice in the Instant Pot, you're gonna use a one cup of rice to 1.25 cups of water ratio. So today in my six quart pot, I'm just gonna add in one cup of brown rice and then one cup of water and then a fourth a cup of water. Then put the lid on, I kinda of shook it up just so that it makes sure all the rice is covered. Put the lid on, make sure the valve set to sealing and then push the manual button or pressure cook button, depending on which model you own. And then use the plus or minus buttons to get it to 22 minutes. Now, after the 22 minutes is up, you're just gonna let that pot sit there for 10 more minutes, and then you can release the pressure and the rice will be perfectly cooked. Number five mashed potatoes, potato salad, all the potatoes. I love making potatoes in my Instant Pot. They cook so quickly. 
And again, I don't have to worry about them boiling over on the stove. I don't even know how to make regular mashed potatoes anymore because I've made them in the Instant Pot so many times now. I just love making mashed potatoes in the Instant Pot. Whenever I make mashed potatoes, I always put about two of this size of potato in per person and how many I want to feed. So let's say I'm feeding four people, I wanna put in about eight um, medium to smallish potatoes. I've already got some in there. I put two cups of liquid in the bottom of the pot and then I'm gonna cut up all my potatoes into about this size of pieces. You can peel if you want. Sometimes I do, sometimes I don't, just depending on how much time I have and um, who I'm serving. Today, I'm just gonna not peel the potatoes, um, but it's totally up to you. Once you have all the potatoes cut up, go ahead and add them into the pot with the water, and then and add in a teaspoon of kosher salt or table salt, whatever you have on hand. Cover the pot, make sure the valve is set to sealing, not to venting. And then you can push the manual button or the pressure cook button, whatever model of Instant Pot you're using. And then set the timer for about 10 minutes for this specific size of potato. Once the time is up, you can just do a quick release, add in some butter and just start mashing. Once they're mashed well, you can add in some milk or I'm using half and half just for more creamy experience. I just add in, I don't know, two, two or three tablespoons is all. And then I add in fresh ground pepper and salt to taste. And there you have it, creamy, delicious, super fast and easy Instant Pot mashed potatoes. Number six, using your Instant Pot as a double boiler. I learned this over the Christmas season when I was dipping pretzels and other things into chocolate. Using your Instant Pot as a double boiler is perfect because you can put it on your counter and you can melt and it keeps the temperature of the chocolate perfect the whole time that you're melting up until you use it all instead of having to reheat it in the microwave or reheat it on the stove or whatever that you're typically doing when you melt chocolate. Instant Pot works so good for this. Here's how I made Instant Pot chocolate pretzels. Here are the items that you will need for your chocolate dip pretzels. You'll need some wax paper or some parchment paper or a si silicone baking mat, something that enables the pretzels not to stick. You'll need some pretzels. I use the twisty kind, a bowl, a glass bowl, or a metal bowl works. Um, and then some melting chocolate. I use this dark chocolate from Ghirardelli brand. It's really good. But you can also use milk chocolate or white chocolate. You can use chocolate chips, but you'll have to add in a tablespoon of shortening with the chocolate chips so that they can be glossy and nice and smooth. For this recipe, we're gonna use the Instant Pot like a double boiler. So add in two cups of water into the bottom of the Instant Pot and turn your Instant Pot to the saute setting and adjust it to more. Then find a glass bowl or a metal bowl that will fit nicely right on top of the Instant Pot. You see how it doesn't fall in, it just kind of sits right there. The water's gonna heat up and we'll pour the chocolate into the bowl and the water will steam up and the bowl and get the chocolate all melty and delicious, but it won't m burn the chocolate, which is the major problem when you're mi microwaving chocolate or trying to cook it in a pan on the stove. It just scorches so easy and burns and it just does not taste good. Still one of those chocolates for good measure. Eat it right now, I dare you. And then just wait a couple minutes until the chocolate starts melting. Every couple of minutes, come back with a spoon and just stir it as those chocolate discs melt. The water's really heating up, so I turned the saute from the more button and I adjusted it down to the less button. And I'm just gonna keep stirring it until it's totally melted and smooth. Once the chocolate is totally melted, Turn off your Instant Pot and then click it over to the Keep Warm setting. This will ensure that the chocolate stays melted and doesn't harden up while you're trying to dip your pretzels, but it's not gonna be boiling away in there. Get a long sheet of your wax paper or parchment paper out and then get those pretzels ready. We're gonna need um, pretzels and then a fork to dip the pretzels with. Take one pretzel at a time and place it on your fork and then just kind of dip it into the chocolate. 
get it nice and dipped and then tap, 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 tap the sides of the bowl so that all the excess chocolate comes off and then you can place it on top of the parchment paper. And then you're gonna repeat this process over and over until all the chocolate is used up. If you'd like, you can add sprinkles to the chocolate dip pretzels. Make sure to put them on the pretzels when the pretzels are still wet or they won't stick very well. Here we are at the very end of the chocolate, just trying to use all of it as much as possible. You might need to get some sort of rubber scraper and kind of scrape all the chocolate into the middle just so that there's enough to be able to dip those last pretzels into. The pretzels only take about 10 minutes to dry and then you can put them in an airtight container. Number seven, macaroni and cheese. I love making mac and cheese in my Instant Pot. You just add a few ingredients in and you press start and you walk away and then you come back, stir in some cheese and it is creamy and delicious and perfect. My favorite mac and cheese recipe is this three cheese mac and cheese recipe. I know you're gonna love it too. Here's how I make it. To make our mac and cheese, we're going to add three and three quarters cups of water into the Instant Pot and then a 16 ounce box or bag of elbow macaroni. I use these big ones because that's what I like, but you can always use the little ones too. Three tablespoons of butter, two teaspoons of kosher salt, two teaspoons of ground mustard, half teaspoon of pepper. You can also use red pepper if you want a little more heat in your mac and cheese. I'm just using black pepper. And that is all we need to get started. This is what it's gonna look like. It's gonna be mostly covered with water, but not totally. Put your lid on, lock it, lock it into place, and make sure the valve is set to sealing. And then use the manual button or the pressure cook button, depending on your model of Instant Pot. And adjust the time to three minutes for al dente pasta or four minutes for a little bit more cooked. I'm gonna do the um, four minutes today because of the bigger noodles. After the time is up, I let it count up until about five minutes. Now I'm gonna release the pressure by moving the valve from sealing to venting. Once the pressure is released, remove the lid. Little hack for you, sometimes when I'm stirring something in the Instant Pot, I take one of these binder clips and just clip it, clip the pot to the side so that it doesn't spin as much so that you can stir it easier. Now I am going to stir in some half and half. You can also use whole milk. I'm using about a cup. And then slowly we're gonna add in our cheese. I grated up eight ounces of uh, sharp cheddar, eight ounces of Monterey Jack, and eight ounces of Colby Jack. So this is our three cheese, mac and cheese. Lots and lots of cheese, it's gonna be good. So we'll do, you know, about a third of that at a time. The longer it sits, the thicker it will get. Right now it's still a little bit runny, but boy, can't wait to dive into that. Now, if you wanna add breadcrumbs to the top, you totally can do that too. Add in about a cup of the panko breadcrumbs and we're going to toast these with our melty uh, crisp lid. So the first thing we need to do is unplug our Instant Pot. Then you take your crisp lid that we have here and plug that thing in. As soon as you put this lid into place, it's going to turn on and then you can adjust the time and temperature. I'm just going to do, I just want to broil up these um, breadcrumbs so they get nice and toasty. So what I'm going to do is just set the temperature for 500 and the time. Let's just start for uh, two minutes to begin and we'll go from there and push this little uh, triangle button. Once you're done using your crisp lid, set it on the silicone mat that came with it. That way it doesn't burn your counter. Oh, just look at how delicious that looks. And the last recipe that I want to share with you today is frozen chicken. I am a procrastinator by nature. It is not something I'm proud of, but I'm definitely always doing things last minute. So when you're like me and you forgot to thaw the chicken, you have frozen chicken that you wanna use for dinner, 
That is where the Instant Pot comes in so handy. You can use your Instant Pot to cook chicken from frozen. And here is how I do that. I usually buy a big bag of chicken breasts at Costco or some other store and keep them in my freezer just for convenience sake. Now, some of the chicken breasts are gonna be huge. Like these ones are pretty big, right? Um, they're gonna take longer to cook than the smaller organic chicken breasts. So decide how long to cook frozen chicken breasts. This is the method. You can use a scale. I can show you where I got it on Amazon in the link below. I zeroed out my scale and now I'm gonna weigh the chicken breasts. So this individual chicken breast is 14 ounces. That's pretty big. So a good rule of thumb for frozen chicken breasts is one minute per ounce. So if I was chi cooking chicken breasts that were, that were about this size, I would cook them for 14 minutes. And that's to get sliceable, juicy chicken breasts. Now, if you wanted shreddable chicken breasts, you're gonna add three minutes to that time. So for shreddable chicken breasts, for like this one, which is 14 ounces, it would be 17 minutes. Pretty easy formula, and that works really well if you have a digital scale. If you don't have a digital scale, you might wanna get one, they're not that expensive. One thing that I really encourage you to do is find chicken breasts that are the same width that are about the same size. That way they'll all cook evenly and you won't get one that is still pink in the middle and one that's totally overcooked. That is a good rule to follow if possible. Find chicken breasts that are the same size. All right, now we know exactly how long to cook these frozen chicken breasts. Let me show you how. So you can either use a trivet. I had this one that came with my Instant Pot. This one I bought, which is like a sling and a trivet in one or you don't have to use any equipment at all. It's up to you. What you do need is a cup of water or broth. Pour that into your Instant Pot. And if you want to steam your chicken, then you would put the chicken on top of a trivet. If you want it braising in the liquid that you have in your Instant Pot, you can go ahead and put the chicken right into the bottom of the pot. Today, I'm gonna to steam mine, um, but it really is up to you on what you prefer. They taste really similar actually, so it doesn't matter too much. I'm going to use my sling and I will put these chicken breasts that are about 14 ounces each and if at all possible try to lay them in a single layer. If not possible what you do is you layer them crosswise like this on top of each other. So that's how I'm going to do it because they're pretty big. They take up a lot of surface area at the bottom of the Instant Pot. So I'm going to lay them crosswise. Now, I want to be able to shred these chicken breasts. So I'm going to use their 14 ounces each. So the average weight was 14 ounces. That's 14 minutes plus 3 minutes. So that's 17 minutes for shreddable chicken breasts. I'm going to use that, that formula for these chicken breasts. So I like to use the manual button and then just go down to 17 minutes. When the pressure cooking time is up, I like to use a natural release for five minutes and then move the valve to venting and open up the pot and get that chicken out and shred it or do whatever you wanna use it for. I just took the chicken out of the pot and it is at an internal temperature about 171, so it is cooked through. These are ready to shred. I hope you'll try these eight best things to make in the Instant Pot. We'll see you next week, bye-bye.